You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Hello, everybody. We are here at the day two, at the end of day two at the Richmond Fishing Expo. It's been absolutely crazy. I've been talking for about 500 hours straight, and somehow I'm still alive. But we save always the best for last. Uh, I don't know if this guy needs much of an introduction. He created one of the absolute coolest spinner bait, or spinner bait, one of the coolest swim baits on the market. He also, you guys have probably seen something else that he partnered with when Matt Allen talked about it at the Christmas special about the swim baits that you need to have. Mike, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks uh, for having me. No, I mean, dude, thank you for coming over to me. I mean, you're uh, a freaking legend in the world of fishing and swim bait designs. And uh, I mean, to, to start off with the people at home, like, how did all this get started? For people that we don't know, you were a Maryland boy. You grew up here. Um, but then from there, you moved away. And in, in this whole craziness, you became a swim bait connoisseur. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was born in D.C. in 70, and I lived here with my dad and my mom. And then they moved with the government to South Mississippi. Oh, and cool. I grew up in South Mississippi and Picayune, Mississippi. And that is where I started my love for fishing and stuff, uh, and the rivers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I went to college and, and started normal job in the restaurant industry for about 20 years. And while I was doing that, I was guiding uh, a lot in various parts of the country, Ross Barnett, Reservoir of Jackson, um, Gunnersville. And then I moved to Atlanta area and I got it on Alatoona uh, for spotted bass. So I've got smallmouth, largemouth spotted bass. I got a good variety of, uh, of species. Um, and while I was guiding, I said, you know what, on Alatoona, it's one of the busiest core of engineer lakes in the world because of its proximity to Atlanta. And when you catch a fish, it usually has some kind of a sore on its mouth because it's been caught so many times, you know? So that's the kind of pressure that you're dealing with in a metro city like Atlanta uh, with a few lake choices. There's only two, there's Lanier and Altoona that's really close, so they get hammered. And I said, you know what? I gotta do something to catch these bigger fish for my clients. They're in there, but how do you catch them? So I just started using the process of elimination. I said, you know what? Going smaller is not gonna make my fish any bigger. What happens if I go bigger? And that's what started this whole transition for me is uh, why I didn't knock them out of the park bigger size wise. I got more consistent. You know, I started <laughs> catching more and more and more. And I think the reason why it worked as well as it did is not a lot of people back there 15 years ago or even now are throwing these bigger baits. They think they're too big um, to catch the fish. And the long story short, the reason you catch them is because you're specifically fishing for them. And did you have any experience in California at the time? Because for you guys that you don't know, and I guess all of our Virginia anglers here, you know, the swim bait craze, really the big mecca of it was the California. And I would just say like the 90s, early 2000s with the trout and the Huddleston's, things of that ilk. Did, what, did you just come up with this idea all on your own uh, without going to California, experiencing that culture? Is that how it came about? You nailed it perfectly. I mean, this all started out in California. And that was the thing that I ran into. That's all trout oriented out in California. They had nothing for shad, for gizzards, for thread fin, for carp, or for any of the big species that we have out here. They also have it out there, but they were carry catering towards trout. So that is, I was one of the first, if not the first, to start doing a shad swim bait. And that is what my motivation was. I started my company with a slogan, a slogan called Trout of the South. Because that's exactly what a gizzard shad okay. is, is compared to the floor, uh, the uh, sorry, the California market. So that is what got the wheels turning for me was to design swim baits um, to catch fish here and in, in the south that caters to our fish. Um, but one thing I understand is is I didn't start this to make a business out of it. I started this to catch bigger fish for my clients. And what happened was is. That started snowballing. I started getting showing some success and catching some bigger fish in some tough lakes. And then I got the reputation, hey, I want to learn how to fish swim bait. So it got to be a vicious cycle. I was making swim baits, going on guy trips, sleeping, making swim baits, going on guy trips. They were, when I go to a gas station, they were, hey, you're the swim bait guy. And I just cut off a spade and give it to them, you know, just to throw it out there. But like I said, I just started the guide. It wasn't my plan to make these baits and to start selling them and stuff. But that's how it ended. It got to the point where I couldn't make them fast enough for the trips. I had to decide, make baits or guide. 
And at that point, I said, you know what? I can always come back and guide if this doesn't take off. 15 years later, here I am. That's you know, absolutely so. crazy. Because again, like the origin of this brilliant idea was so encapsulated. It was just you here, no outside. You just knew like this is a need in the market in my area. And I'm going to go out there and perfect it and, and through trial and error, right. like what you did. What was the first design? Were you trying to emulate uh, something in particular with, with the bull shad? Was it, are you trying to do gizzard and thread fin? Or did you pick one that you wanted to imitate more than the other? Yeah, I started off with a multi-segment bait. Multi-segment, okay. Um, this is the bluegill profile of the bullgill. I had a shad profile called the bull shad. And that's what, that was my bread and butter. And to this very day, it's still my bread and butter. Uh, it, it, we, 15 years later, we're still selling these things to retailers and customers all over the United States and all over the world. Um, so the, the bull shad was my first bait. It was a six inch. I went to seven and then I went to the five inch. And I was a one man show in my, in my house, on my kitchen table, putting these things together with a little tote bucket with supplies and stuff like that. And, um, and then how I did got, you do that in guy? That's yeah, insane, man. Yeah, That's a just, lot on a schedule. <laughs> I mean, it's a true garage built starting from the ground up business. I mean, from zero sales to a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand, and it just kept going. And uh, I ruined a couple of rooms in my house. My wife said, okay, we need to get another house where you can have a basement. I ruined the basement resin getting on the floor. We had a, um, a water heater bust and that flooded the whole basement. And I said, well, we had the insurance pay for that. I said, Mike, I want, I want my basement back. We need to get you a shop that you can tear up and outside of the house. So that's when I moved into a new shop and we've already moved twice wow. since we've been in the new shop. So now we have two shops side by side and we have a storefront in Atlanta, Georgia, Ackworth, Georgia, to be more specific. And uh, we, we do shop tours and that kind of stuff. How many people do you have working um, for you now? Like going from I, garage till now, it's gotta be crazy. I have, uh, I have a full-time painter. Oh, wow. I have a general manager. I have a shipper person and I have three to four people that work in the shop, making baits, tuning baits, painting baits. Um, I also have my son and his, his best friend working for me as well a couple of days a week. Um, so seven to eight, depending on the week and depending on who's in school and who's not in school. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about seven or eight people. It's, so, I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Like it, it, it's crazy. Cause like when, even when I tried to do this, it was like, I thought I'd fish more and you don't, <laughs> you get in the industry and you think no, you're going to be mm -hmm. able to fish more. It's like, no, 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 no. Uh, There's another side of this bad boy. People don't see. They say, if you want to go in the fishing industry and you want to fish and you want to fish, don't go in the fishing industry. <laughs> That's fine. It's that true. Freaking fine. It is so you know, true. I've always been, uh, you know, if I keep my foot off the pedal, somebody's going to pass me up. You mm -hmm. know, when I'm fishing, I'm thinking about work. When I'm asleep, I'm thinking about work. It's a just true entrepreneurship, you know, where you're just always thinking about doing the best next thing and being ahead of the curve and all that kind of stuff. How do you come up? That's, that's a great, uh, that's a great thing to talk about. When you come up with these ideas, the rat, for example, um, we're going to talk about the burrito at some point. Is this just you? Do you go on a mountain somewhere and meditate or do you have think tank ideas? Like how do you come up with these really cool designs? Um, that's a good question. Um, part of my job as the president or owner of the company is I have to navigate us to where we need to be going. And I look for, I look at the market as a whole, what's missing or what is it doing? What is, uh, uh, whether it be a, a size of a bait, a type of a bait or a style of a bait, um, what's missing in the market, um, for example, I'll give the rat for example. Um, our rat, our first generation rat was very, very crude. It was just basically carved on a lathe, and I just put two eyes on it, and it swam really, really well. But what I saw missing from the market was a realistic looking rat. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have here something that has hair like features, it has the visual ears, eyes, mouth, nose, and nostrils. It is one of the most realistic rats on the market. It's also one of the most competitive markets out there because of yeah, so many people seven. have rats. Almost every company has a rat out there. So I just wanted to make sure, hey, we got the most realistic one out there and one that swims, in my opinion, one of the best swimming rats out there. It, it, I, I like you said that about everyone has it. We, I mm -hmm. had the opportunity to interview uh, the, the individual who runs Nico Bates, mm -hmm. and he talks about how people don't understand how cutthroat the fishing industry is and how competitive it is. Yeah. And he really opened my eyes to what you guys have to go through 
no one talks about it. it's hardcore P yeah. the companies are very competitive yeah. with ideas and, and and trying to borrow we'll say uh people's ideas so mm -hmm. when you're going to go from you know to thought to product is that five months is that many years like for this rat here how long did it take you to think the design in your head to it being on the shelves everywhere good question um i have a catalog of baits ready to go oh wow okay you know i'm, I'm not just doing it by the steam of my pants i've had oh yeah catalog of baits mm -hmm. that are in all phases of development whether it be just carved need to be molded or, or i have a couple of uh, testers swimming on fishing them uh to hey these baits are finished so i've got de several different phases and then i decide okay what's the best fit for us for the time that we're at you know i look at hey are people starting to catch on to this little idea i want to try to be first at it before somebody else notices this little niche in the market um yeah, or you know whatever that reason is so i i put them in, in order of what i'm going to do and I just picked the one that best fits, you know. Um, you know, we already had a big giant nine and eight inch god, and I said a lot of people are starting to fish smaller swim baits, entry level uh, size baits, which six to seven to five inch. So we came out with a smaller god. That's beautiful. Uh, so. I'm show this off the bigger camera right here, guys. Look at the detail in that that artwork. Now we got two cameras going. That is absolutely. It's, your size. It's, nine inches. It, it's it's beautiful and guys i'll i'll go by his uh booth again tomorrow and do a slow shot it is artwork when you see all these baits displayed in these cases it, it just looks like something you'd see in like some kind of like british movie where they pull out all the fine wines it's it that's the thing i love about the culture of the swim bait is the devil in the detail and this is something also is the swim bait culture is insane and it's so tribal and cultish <laughs> have is it regional? We talked about that with California. They're all trout. Where you were when you when you did this in Georgia, is the swim bait culture down there different than it is in Virginia than it is in Alabama, or is it all pretty much the same? Um, well, you have pockets, pockets. Of, uh, of swim bait cultures in the United States. Of course, California, Texas, Georgia, creeping into Florida. Really? Oh, wow. um, the New England states. Uh, the DMV area and New England is uh, the biggest market. Right New, now. England? New England of all places, really? probably even more popular than California. Probably they are. They have a very huge cult following. Oh, it's in insane! The New England area. You wouldn't think it, but it's ridiculous. You know. When it, did that market start? The New England market is that new? Like, uh, it's been going on a while. You know, it's been going on a while. Wow. I mean, when I used, to, I did shows there every year in Boxborough, Massachusetts. And uh, that show is by far the wildest one that I do. It's the most busiest show that I do uh, in, in, in the New England area. So, That's insane. Yeah, I mean, it's, they have so many lakes up there. It's crazy, you know. And, and there's no such thing as a private lake. If there's water, you can fish it. You know, I would have lost money yeah. to you if you told me New England yeah, was that yeah. good for your business. That blows my mind because you don't yeah. think of like a, a, the swim bait culture there. Uh, you do think like the Southern Belt, where you got those big fisheries, or of course California, but like that's 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 that's, that's crazy. That's really crazy. Yeah. Another innovation, a, a pretty cool fact is, as you know, how a lot of things start in Japan in the uh, in the uh, conventional market, mm -hmm. you know, the Nico rig and all those little finesse tactics and stuff, and then they gradually come over here to the states, California, and then it leaps over here. Swim baits, it starts here. We are the innovators for That's the cool. most part. Wow. Um, you know, we come up with the cool stuff, the custom made resin baits. You don't see a lot of resin baits in, 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 in Japan or uh, uh, you got the depths and you got a couple other uh, uh, small baits, uh, uh, plastic baits and that kind of stuff. But most of the hardcore swim baits are made here in the United States. And we are the innovators and drivers of that market. Why do you think that is? That's a good question. I don't know why Japan hasn't really been a big it's, market yeah. for those. I don't know if I've, I've never been to Japan, by the way. But yeah, so it's I'm just, just like jerk baits over there, drop yeah, shots. Yeah. Thing. It's so crazy that this was the one that we 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 were first on right. in the marketplace. Yeah. Huh. I mean, the one thing that I learned is is if you have big bass, that's a market for me. Where my base will excel: California, Georgia, Florida, New England, Virginia is got giant fish here, mm -hmm. you know, giant. You got Briar, Ray, Chickahominy, 10-pound pluses. Um, 
and Japan has that too. They do. You know, they got the world record by what, 24, 25, whatever, however yeah. big it was. It's crazy that yeah. I, I would think, honestly, there would be more of a market over there for yeah, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely yeah. insane. So now, what you're starting to see now is more conventional companies starting to market slim baits. You know, we did the baby bull shad. You're starting to see Chad shad. You're starting to see a lot of the uh, conventional companies catch on to that buying wagon of, of, of what we're doing. Partner with the swim bait guys like us, like myself. And like, uh, um, is it cool know, now? Is it hip? Right, like, right. It, it is different. Like, when I was a kid, if you wanted to get a bluegill bait when I was really young, that was like you had to order that thing special. Right. And, and like you said, it's only, you see more YouTubers or professional anglers fishing big swim baits. Right. What changed where the culture was like people are willing to like experiment with these? Is it, is it just everyone sees them now? Right. People want custom. People want something that a lot of other people don't have. It's, and I think what makes them work is, is because a lot of people don't have them. Therefore, the, a lot of fish don't get to see them. So that's Which the one what thing you is found the in education Georgia, yeah. of the fish, you know, when the Cinco just came out. It was crazy. When the A-Rig just came out, it was crazy. Same thing with big baits. You know, when you start showing them something different, they become dumb. And in a very nice general term, dumber, I should say. Um, and then they wise up, you know. And this is one of those niche markets where price, in some, in some regards, limits the supply and the the, the, the the availability to the fish to see them so that is what a lot of this is as you go to a new pond that your your brother says there's never catches any fish there and you start throwing something big like they've never seen before and then they just start whacking them whacking them and it, it, it's like a light switch sometimes on some of these lakes that have never seen the bigger baits before uh, so that's on a lot and a the reason why they work is because nobody throws them and they're too big. People think they're too big. I, you are, would be the guy to talk about this. What is the fear of throwing these big baits? Um, uh, again, a classic example would be when Zaldane brought um, the mag draft, that big one. I think that's the one everyone knows about um, as another bait. But it was like you had to throw this bigger bait. But so many people are afraid. And like, well, I'll throw a tiny one. I'll throw a 2.8 inch kite, something like that. But you're right. There's something about that big bait, and it it blows logic sometimes. But they'll smoke that thing all day. Yes. But people are afraid to throw it, right. and so it's like you almost you have to convince the angler that this will work, yes. and that's got to be hard. <laughs> okay. I mean, keep in mind, I started this 15 years ago. It was freaking hard. You know, I called <laughs> my taco shops. You know, said, Mike, you're never going to sell this bait for 50 bucks. Here we are, 15 years later. That's one of my best selling baits by far. Sure. You know, so and that's a cheap bird. You know. Um, but I mean, you see it here every day. What do you catch with these? You know, they're thinking grouper or they're thinking tuna <laughs> or whatever, yeah. you know, uh, you know, but we fish for big trophy bias. That doesn't mean that a little two pounder can't hit this. Hey, mm -hmm. absolutely. will. hundred percent. You know, I caught crappie on, on nine S baits. It feels like you're reeling in pond straw. <laughs> you know, um, so don't regulate the size of the bait by the size of the mouth of the fish because small A's and spots especially are super aggressive. They will attack anything. I don't care how big it is. And uh, you can catch them by it's not something the way that I would actually go target them, but I'm targeting those bigger fish, you know. My theory on why they work as well, aside from the availability and them not being able to see them, is, is I'm a big guy. I sit on a couch and I see a peanut up on the counter. That represents a threadfin shaft. I'm not getting out of my chair for that peanut. I'm too big. It's not, a, it's not worth my time to do that. Somebody puts a T bone up on that counter. I'm going to get out of my I'm Here's your T bone. I'm going to get out of my chair and I'm going to eat that easy meal. Mm -hmm. They want to eat once and be done and sit back down in the chair and watch tv or sit there Makes sense. And, and, and and be comfortable you know big fish get big by eating a lot of food and not exerting a lot of energy if they eat a lot of food and they're moving a lot they're gonna lose weight just like a human will mm. so they need to sit and be methodical about what they chase a lot of you talk a lot about followers when you fish these big baits that is proof that these bigger baits can draw these fish oh, yeah. out long distances. I'm fishing one dock here, 20 feet, 30 feet over this way. I fish from another dock. It's coming to me 
She's my baby. So you have that drawing power. You're expanding the strike zone of that bias by offering him a one-time meal that will fill him up instead of him chasing five little minnows or thread fin all over the place. It was the forward-facing sonar before yeah. forward-facing sonar. I mean, it was the way that you could go out there, you know, 10 years ago. If you throw a big glide bait, for example, it's going to pull fish and you're going to see them. Right. And it, it's it's so crazy the draw factor that these have. And guys, you know, I'm going to, I'll, I'll answer some of the questions limitedly here tonight because we are <laughs> time crunch tonight. But um, if somebody wanted to have success and, and wanted to get used to throwing a big bait, is it more of a seasonal thing when they'll have success? Is it a patience thing? What is at least one tip for the big bait if they want to get into it? You're asking me about seasonal? Yeah. Okay. Typically, hard baits are more early spring, spring, summer, and fall. Shallow type. In. You don't usually fish these very, very deep. Most hard baits are made to be fished subsurface, four to five feet or less. Now, you start putting bills and stuff, that they go down a little bit deeper. That's a little bit different. You're mm. expanding your, your seasonal output, kind of like crankbaits, you know. Um, but most of these baits are made to be fished shallow and don't make the mistake of trying to fish them too deep because they're really not designed. You start weighing a glide down, it's not going to glide very well. The, the way a glide swims is if it's neutral buoyancy, so it can do the wide sweep. So I fish these baits, the burrito, um, there you go. for deeper presentations, forward facing sonar type stuff especially when they're 15 or five, 10 feet or deeper. So that's what I usually do is uh, we took these on from Gail uh, Ratcliffe, the, uh, the designer of these, and uh, we, we make them for them. Now, is this a, uh, what type of paddle is design is this? Is this a boot tail or is this a, a normal paddle tail type style here? That is tail? a normal paddle tail. Paddle tail? A boot tail is like a Huddleston. Yeah. And that's, guys, that's really important. So, like, yeah. uh, the, the Huddleston tail design is completely different than a yeah. Bastrix or, um, I don't know, what's a, right. a, a Kitex, something like that. There is differences yeah. in tail design that do give you different functionality. Yeah. I'm not trying to give you a full expo tonight of swim bait fishing. There are people way smarter than me. Go find that online. Yeah. But yeah. there is detail stuff that you need to know before you go to a store and just buy something random. And I think that's when people don't have success and get turned off of swim baits. They don't know why a glide bait probably doesn't work at this certain time of year, but then they go out and do that anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I usually use the paddle tail most because it's obviously what I use, but it's very easy to swim. Um, I, I don't do very well with vortex tails on non-trout lakes. So I use the vortex like the Huddleston uh, more on trout type lakes. Or I can't get them to hit on a, on a shad lake for some reason. So I think they like that little kick more on the uh, shad lakes and the herring lakes than they do the boot tail. Your mileage may vary, but that's just my opinion on what, what I've experienced. So um, I like these for the for, for overall. They'll hit these on trout lakes and whatever, and I usually use the vortex on trout lakes if I if I have run into any. And do you typically, do you bottom bump these, or do you just slow roll them like a spinner bait? What do you find the most success with something like this? Good question. Um, we make these in two sizes. We make this one in two rates of fall, a medium and a fast. Um, and it depends on how deep you want it. We fish Mexico a lot, the really? deep canyon lakes. So, you know, we're dropping them 15, 20, 25 feet and just kind of hitting the bottom and then just slow rolling them in a little bit, maybe a medium with speed. Just keep it close to the bottom, long points, pumps, mm. that kind of stuff. Um, but then you can use forward sonar and do that as well. You could fish for suspended fish. You could just fish it casually. It's a very versatile bait, depending on how how long you let it sink and how fast you retrieve it. So um, the hardest part is fishing those suspended fish, especially if you don't have forward sonar. So it's kind of a casting in the dark thing. But if you're fishing it shallow for five feet, you know, of course you can bring the fish will move three or four feet easily to catch a bait. So it's a little harder, deeper uh, when they're suspended, unless you have the forward sonar or if you're fishing the bottom and they're close to the bottom and just drag the bottom. When it comes to the difference between gizzard shad and thread fin, I mean, definitely in Virginia, those are probably the two uh, most relevant bait fish that we're dealing with. Uh, Occoquan Reservoir and Lake Cheson down near Richmond, there's been multiple fish close to 10 pounds caught there, which is right. pretty big for us. Right. And a lot of times they're eating like a gizzard shad, generally speaking. 
And for the audience at home, when you're specifically targeting a gizzard shad, and guys, it's a bigger shad, more like this big glide bait there. Um, how are you approaching that when it comes to tackle? Are you going full 20, 10 foot rod, 100 pound braid? When you're targeting big fish on a big bait, okay. what do you like to use? My tackle yes, collection? Sir. Um, basically, I there's obviously three kinds of line. You got your mono, your four carbon, and your, and, your, uh, and your mono, and your braid. I like mono. It's foolproof. But you do have to be mindful that it has stretch in it. And the, what the stretch is going to have it to is to get that hook set. If you have good form while you're fishing, you have your rod pointed towards the bait or slightly off, you get the full hook set. Mm. Okay? You're doing almost 270. But if you're off like this, you're not getting the full hook set. You have to be mindful of your form for the mono to work for you. The braid, on the other hand, if you use 50 pound braid and you and, and you snag a log, that line is going to deep dig into your spool. Your next cast is going to see which one's stronger, the bait or the line. And it's usually the line that breaks, and your bait's going to go sailing. That is that, and the, and the visibility of braid are the two downfalls of braid. The wall carbon, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have the notch strength. There are a lot of people out there that use wall carbon, and they have confidence in their line. But if you're not confident in your line and you don't, you know, you, 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 you are fishing clear water, you can use the floral carbon, but just be mindful, you need to check your knock a lot because they cannot take a hit as long, especially the cheaper floral carbon. Mm -hmm. You know, you start getting into the, the deeper and the $40, $40 200 yards full, those are better quality lines and have a better knock strength than a lot of the other. Uh, uh, do you have a knot that you like for your leader material? Like what type of knot for the leader material do you like? Like a, a FG knot or a uni knot? What what do you prefer? It's called a, uh, a, a San Diego jam, double San Diego jam. San Diego jam yeah. knot, guys. Google that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Polymer knot works if uh -huh. you tie it right. Just you don't want to overlap the strands. Just tie a pretty knot. You're fine. But the San Diego jam, double San Diego jam is the easiest to not screw up. So um, it's the same double loop like a polymer. And, and it's the same kind of concept. Um, I don't like single loop, uh, single strands through the aisle. I like that double strand through there That's just smart. for extra extra support. So That's the double San Diego jam is what I use the most. In in your studies, when you create all these baits, do, do thread fin and gizzard shed act differently? So if people want to use your baits and they're trying to understand like the, the behavior of the bait fish, do, do all shad do the same thing if they're trying to use like the buka, for example? What should they be aware of? As far as the forage? Yeah. Um, the seasonal migration of shad is one thing you need to be familiar with. Usually in the winter time, they seem to sit out in the main lake and, 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 and they're not in the, uh, the backs of the creeks as much because it's much colder in the backs of the creeks, much warmer in the, uh, in the, th in the, uh, in the, uh, the, on the main lake. I like to fish where the sun hits the rocks. And when the sun comes up, and first place it hits on a bluff wall or rocks, that is going to warm up quick. And those shad seem to gravitate towards that warmer water, and so do the bass for the very same reason. You know, they want to be as comfortable as they can. So that is one thing that I like to do in the wintertime. The also, the other thing you need to be mindful of is what color they turn in the water. When it's stained or mud, everything turns white. So a white swim bait is a bone That is swim freaking bait brilliant. Is, 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 a, is, a, is an excellent choice. The bass are white. The, white, the crappie are super white. The thread fin are white. The gizzard are white. I mean, it's just. It, How it, did it, you figure? That is so brilliant. Uh, like, that is such a cool uh, observation. But, uh, I mean, I learned about the bone trick several years ago. One of my uh, my best customers at uh, uh, Hammond's Fishing Center on Lanier, Jason Hammond, he says, Mike, you need to come out with a bone swim bait. I said, why? He says, that's what we sell the most of. So I just took just a white clicked, bone yeah. and went fishing. I'm like, oh, crap, this works. That's so... And bone is, I mean, how many baits in bone? The bone wake baits, bone sammies, bone yeah. dark spooks, you know. You never uh, think something actually looks yeah. this white, but it, uh, yeah. It just works. Clear, dirty, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. I like a white bait. It seems like I have a halo around it, and it's, it's easily to see, but... I like to be able to see my bait a lot, and that makes it easier for me to see and the fish love it. And guys, it's a really good observation before you go out and you go spend the money on a bait. Go to your local fishery. What is the color of the bait fish in the water before you go out there and you buy something? Because again, matching the hatch is so important. Right. 
Um, yeah, with that said, like if, if someone came to you, what are a couple of colors they should pick just besides bone, of course? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not a big proponent of color. What I try to do is I try to break my colors down into three categories. All the colors in the spectrum go down to three. Neons, which is your whites, your pinks, and your yellows, your chartreuse. Those are your spotted bass and your smiley colors. You know, they like those. It hurts your eyes to look at Hot it. colors, yeah. yeah. They, they, you know, they, they love that. Then you have your natural colors, your clear water colors. Um, that fish need a visual aspect of it. So I like the natural colors. All my natural colors fit in there. Most of these here are natural. Um, and then you have your dark colors for your overcast days and your and your and your night fishing. So, well, my theory is this: you only have so many times, only only minutes or hours in a day to fish bait. Mm -hmm. Thousands of colors. The 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 the, 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 uh, the, 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 the situation is changing. You're, you're cloudy, cold, wind, whatever. So you got to match the color with all those different things. It's changing. It's ever changing. So how do you know which one works the best? So That's I true. try to narrow it down to three to just to not confuse myself as much and keep it simple for that very reason. So, guys, that's why it's worth color I have. Yeah, because we, <laughs> as guys, we go down the rabbit hole so much with colors and stuff, yeah. and that's so true that you can overcomplicate everything in your head no, just no. so freaking yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, I get the one other question would be for, for baits like this. If they don't, if they can't get it here, what's the best place to do it? Should they go to your website? Where can they order these products? What's yeah. the best place for people to order? Yeah, you them? could go to bullshad.com, Google it. We Google it extremely well. Um, we take orders. We're also accepting dealer orders. If anybody wants to become a dealer, absolutely. Uh, for burritos, nachos, or any of the uh, our OG color baits that are on our website are available for sale for the dealer shop. Fantastic. So. And there are any social media outlets? Do you guys have Instagram and Facebook as well? I'm sorry. Do you guys have Facebook and Instagram as well? Yeah, that's Facebook and Instagram. We're very, very uh, popular. We're also on the Swim Bay Universe, which is a very popular swim bait enthusiast Facebook page. We have like 40,000 members of that. Uh, so we're very active on social media. So guys, again, like and subscribe to him on Instagram, Facebook. Go check out his website if you can't get to the Richmond Expo. Again, there is so much more literature than that's beyond my education to understand <laughs> on YouTube and stuff. So just go there and, and get involved in the swim bait culture because the swim bait thing is starting to hit Virginia hard now. People are catching the bug. You're seeing more and more people do it, so get on it right now. Mike, thank you so much. You're a busy man, but I really appreciate your you time betcha, today. You and guys, we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.